Derek, welcome to the show. Thank you. That was, uh, yeah, I, I want everybody to join me on my level. This is what I deal with every day. So uh, uh, welcome to hell. Well, we've been, uh, you know, obviously yeah, yesterday was a holiday, but um, much of the world and the U.S. government's attention is now fixed on Gaza once again and consumed by the very important question and investigation of are Israel's dozens of attacks on uh, refugees and tents in Rafa? Does that constitute a breach of international law? And more importantly, does it constitute a crossing of Biden's red line? You'll be surprised to find out the answer to both of those questions is no. But <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd like to I'd actually I'd like to start I'd like to start with a story that I think much of the you know American and international press is saying could be we could be on the verge of a big metaphor occurring. And that is, of course, the pier. <laughs> the pier. The, this, this is a, this is a metaphor pier. of international proportions. The uh, the U.S. aid pier constructed by the U.S. military to deliver aid to Gaza has sunk and floated floated away. Is this like more embarrassing than the uh, the Houthis are about to get a load of democracy? <laughs> they, fuck, they fucked around and found out. They messed with the Chuck Norris of country. I like. I think the U.S. building Homer Simpson's barbecue pit in Gaza <laughs> is like maybe more embarrassing. I don't know. <laughs> I I don't know why they haven't already called it the Joe Biden Memorial Pier. I know he's not dead, but uh, it seems like <laughs> he's close enough that they could just <laughs> just name it after him. But yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's quite a story. Well. <laughs> You know, I mean, like, obviously, uh, people people are taking the opportunity to to dunk on Biden right now because of, um, you know, the sort of allegorical uh, clarity that such an event uh, provides. But I'll say, look, we couldn't get Aiden. They wanted to get Aiden. We couldn't get Aiden. So they built a pier. We just couldn't. We couldn't get Aiden. Our client state that we supply with all its weapons wouldn't let us do it. So we just had no choice and no leverage, obviously, to get aid in uh, overland, which would be the far more sensible option. Look, did it work? No. Um, while it was actually still <laughs> floating, did it deliver any aid? Not as far as I can yeah, tell. Not, not really. No. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, look, several, several pallets of aid were possibly delivered in the course of the career of the peer. But I want to say, like, look, Biden truly is like FDR. You know, like if something doesn't work, just keep doing it. Just keep try something else. If the pier sinks, build another pier. If that pier sinks, build another. Build two piers. Uh, if, if those also float away, construct a catapult of some kind that can bypass the sea entirely. <laughs> we could put one of those kinetic delivery devices, like a satellite, in orbit and just kinetically uh, deliver them on a tungsten rod to lure the aid to Gaza and. Take care of a lot of things that way. I think. <laughs> <laughs> the aid, the aid that we dropped from our orbital platform um, was delivered, but also um, destroyed all also of Gaza. Killed everybody. In the process. Yeah, like and also the entire killed everybody Eastern Mediterranean when, has been wiped out. When the aid landed and connected with the crust of the Earth, it caused a <laughs> nine point oh magnitude earthquake. Master Chief, you mind telling me what you're doing with that uh, cardboard box filled with thirty five year old MREs? <laughs> Sir, finishing this humanitarian aid mission. <laughs> oh, you know, I mean, just they, it's a man. They had a dream to build a pier and the pier, the pier sunk. But hopefully it's I mean, it's had better another, days. <laughs> yeah. Like you a know. week ago. <laughs> <laughs> we, we Just let's think back to the, the good times when the pier was still standing at a cost of three hundred million dollars. But yeah, it's not like there are roads that um, we could access to to deliver this aid. No, Gaza's that, famously that, cut off from from <sighs> land. And what makes me it. sick about all this is how badly I know that the Biden administration really wanted to deliver that crucial humanitarian aid. It's killing them that they can't do it. And I'm sure I know it eats them up inside. But Pier Two mission is a go. I hear they're going to oh, fix the okay. pier. The, the pier is yeah, going to be back. They're towing the pier. My understanding is they're towing the damaged parts to Ashdod, the, the Israeli port nearby, and they're going to fix it and put it back in place. This is after, like, it was it was basically like an extended Three Stooges routine. Like, there were four ships that ran aground. One ship ran aground, and then they tried to get that one off the coast. And another, <laughs> you know, the ship that tried to do that ran aground. And they like just, like, piled up on each other. And also, there have been 
uh, injuries. Like at, at least one U.S. soldier was seriously injured, I think, because uh, apparently they couldn't figure out that building this pier out of like bubblegum wrappers and tinfoil uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean during storm season, there was going to be some weather <laughs> and and they just didn't anticipate that. Isn't that like how everyone in the Navy always dies, though? Like even SEALs? Like once at once every two years, Navy SEALs will like actually die during combat because their helicopter crash. But like 98% of Navy deaths are like it was a training exercise or they were like they were sending a fleet to try and scare someone. And like seven guys fell into the nuclear reactor that powers the aircraft carrier. Or or like there was that that incident in, in the Red Sea just recently where two SEALs. I mean, one, one guy like slipped as he was getting on a boat that they were trying to interdict. And then, you know, another guy went after him and, and fell. They both fell in the You're water. You're the water lost. guys. <laughs> You're the water guy. How are you like dying the second you get in water? That's not good. I feel like I could survive in the sea longer than that. Like, it well, just, like everyone in the Navy dies in the most ignominious ways. There are guys getting purple hearts because, like, a Dyson Airblade blew their hands off. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, Derek and Felix, uh, you know, this is, this is the Mediterranean. And I'm hearing reports that the initial construction of the pier did not make the proper offerings to angry Poseidon, and they were thus not sparing mm. his wrath. But Pier 2, believe me, they're going to make the, the, the proper offerings, and that aid, oh, that aid's just going to get in there. You're gonna, you won't believe how much aid we're getting in. Speaking of uh, aid, I have noticed over the last week, uh, uh, Kirby and Matt Miller and all their favorite spokespeople, they, they, have, they have very slightly changed the metric for like what they say constitutes an aid delivery from like, they're like, they, they say things like, just last week, 360 metric tons of relief aid was mm -hmm. delivered to Gaza, which is like, mm -hmm. I don't know, six trucks worth for two and a half million people. <laughs> Kirby was talking about shipping pallets the other day, too, yeah. which is like fucking Costco gets more <laughs> pallet deliveries <laughs> than Gaza has. That, I think that's to hype the pier because you can't do truckloads. I mean, you can sort of do truckloads after it comes off the pier and ostensibly goes someplace else to be distributed. But who knows how much that I mean, they're they're doing like five trucks a day or there was one point where they did i think 15 trucks and they all got intercepted by hungry people who just looted them like ransacked them uh so they're not really getting that either so they have to do this like metric tons coming ashore to try and you know convince people that this has been worth it well uh another thing they're desperately trying to convince people of is as i, as I referenced earlier that, 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 that somehow their red line regarding a major invasion of rafa has somehow still uh, not been crossed or whatever like i mean how many people and you know what like over over this fucking weekend we we have biden and like the head of the eu talking about all these videos of beheaded babies they've seen and then everyone's just like okay can we see these videos do they exist and israel was like bet <laughs> you, you want to see a video of this we'll show you one and it's just like like okay so like we got god knows how many people just being incinerated in plastic tents and I guess like the, the big change, I mean, like it's not a big change, but I just the thing that like uh, when they have nothing left to say, they, they keep recycling certain tropes. And the one that they're hitting really hard is this idea about human shields, this idea mm -hmm. that like I know this looks bad, but like it wouldn't happen if, if Hamas wasn't embedding themselves in a civilian population or or literally hiding behind like the way they make it sound is like every Hamas fighter that's killed was like standing in directly behind like a kindergarten class. And they just like, well, what do you want us to do? Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, you know, the, the Pentagon is in Arlington. I mean, it's right outside the Capitol. Like I, you know, that seems to be a legitimate military target embedded in a civilian population. Uh, the Israeli military headquarters is in downtown Tel Aviv. So, uh, you know, I, I, th these things are, you know, I, it's selectively applied. And, and when you talk about Gaza, which is one of the most, if not the most densely populated areas on earth, you know, where else would they be other than among civilians? There is no place else for them to go. But it, you're, I mean, I think, you know, the, the human shield thing has been uh, talked about in the aftermath of this, you know, horrific uh, airstrike and uh, just outside, it was just west of Rafa. Uh, I've also seen now that, that the uh, excuse they're offering, the, the Israelis are offering, is that the, this attack, which took place late Sunday and caused, a fire that ran, you know, ran through this tent encampment and you know, killed 
at least 45 people and, and just awful uh, scenes, awful, gruesome uh, deaths. Um, they, they said they, they were attacking a Hamas facility and they killed two senior Hamas, uh, you know, baddies. And the claim is that this very small targeted airstrike that they did with a small bomb, you know, not, you shouldn't have caused all this. Now they, they're, they're arguing that what, that it set off an ammunition dump that must've been nearby or an ammunition depot, uh, that Hamas is using. And that caused secondary explosions that then caused the fire. And I, I don't know if, they teach the concept of cause and effect in, in Israeli military academies or like in schools, but you're still responsible for that. Like you're still responsible. Your bomb still set off the chain of events that led to all these people being incinerated. And it's, uh, it, it's been sort of uh, fascinating to watch them trot that out as an excuse. Like, Oh, you can't blame us. We only, you know, started this, uh, this horrible <laughs> thing. You, you can't blame us. We just started the fire. That's all right. It, it was always burning since the world was turning. <laughs> like, would you have, like, the most advanced fighter, strike fighter, multi-role jets in the world like Israel has, and you're fighting against an enemy that has, like, no meaningful air defense. It's not like they have, like, any modern air defenses. They don't even have, like, triple A's, like, anti-aircraft artillery. There's nothing stopping them from, like, going extremely low. They have targeting pods that could see just insane distances the point is you know when you're looking at a fucking grouping of tents when you're looking directly at well i mean they already knew it because they told the refugees to go here but like right. you don't do that right. by accident you you need a lot of visual confirmation to do that uh it's insulting to anyone who knows even a little bit how these things work even if you you take them at their word, you know, uh, going al along those same lines, you know when there's an ammo dump dangerously close to what you're going to bomb, and the, there's a risk of spillover causing you know some kind of a horrible chain reaction. You you can see that. That's not you know it's it's not like this was clearly. It's not like the ammo was being stored you know fifty feet underground in a in one of the the horrifying tunnels uh, because then, you know, it wouldn't have uh, been set off by the, the first explosion. So, you know, th this is, there's no way they didn't know or at least couldn't have seen what they were, what was in the area that they were targeting. Uh, either they didn't care or they, they did it deliberately. Well, I'll expect your, uh, uh, Derek and Felix, I'll expect your apologies uh, soon to be forthcoming <laughs> because Israel has just released another Baba Booey phone call uh, that shows, that exonerates them completely. It's two Hamas terrorists. <laughs> That, that have been, you know, intercepted in comms saying, yeah, oh, yeah, like uh, it was it was our. Yeah, we blew, we blew them up. That, that was us. Oh, uh, can you believe I'll everyone's blaming Israel? Oh, all Akbar, all Akbar to you. Um, <laughs> good day today. Uh, did you know that all the people who died are our fault? Oh, yeah. No, I did know that. Um, I let's try to blame Israel anyway, though. Oh, OK. Yeah, we, we should blame Israel every anyway, because we hate Jews. The Holocaust didn't happen, by the way. Um, hey, I know that we hate Jews um, and that we're, we're, we're mass rapists. Brett Gilman's actually really funny and we don't admit it because it would, you know, validate Zionism. But he's actually really funny. Modest Yahoo is actually better than most like black rappers. <laughs> Okay, goodbye, Allah Akbar. And, and this, this is a recording. <laughs> this is evidence. This cannot be refuted. Yeah, that's, there's no refuting that. Um, but yeah, like it's just the, uh, you know, more of the uh, moral and spiritual degradation of uh, this land we call our own. Um, and the, it's just like, after what, like a half a year of this shit now, like it's just, it, this issue's not going away. And, and then like if you read, you know, Politico and everything, <laughs> or like the press, they're like, God, wow, it, things are getting real dicey with this election. We're really worried about it. But like rather than do this like imaginary sort of bargaining, like you're some sort of like policy expert or political strategist about like counting votes and, ex you know, like, oh, ooh, hmm, like well, what, what will this mean for, you know, Wisconsin or blah, blah, blah. I just wish Democrats and the people who like Joe Biden would just admit that like our policy <laughs> towards Israel and Palestine is exactly like they approve of it. Like what we're seeing right now is the United States' policy towards Gaza. It's going according to plan. So there's no red line to be crossed. Like there's there's no 
there's nothing that's going to pull it back. And there's, there's nothing that Israel can do that would cause these people to be like, this is too much. This is what they want. And I just wish these people had the balls to just say it out loud. It's, it's interesting because they've made the decision that it's better to portray Biden as a, a weakling, like completely impotent than to, to just embrace what's happening. So they, they, that's why you get these leaks of, you know, he's really disappointed or he's really concerned or we're really frustrated with Netanyahu and we're going to really let him have it the next time there's a phone call or whatever. And I, I just question, I mean, from a purely political perspective, just on the, the way this race is, is kind of playing out. I question the wisdom of this because the big concern that people seem to have with Biden is he's too old. He's weak. He's, he's not up to the job. We don't, we can't, uh, you know, sort of rely on him being in office for another four years. And, you know, I mean, Benjamin Netanyahu saddles this guy and rides him like a pony once a week for eight months. Like what the fuck do you think that does to his image as a, as a strong leader uh, or as a guy who's aware of his day-to-day existence and what, where he is at any given time. Like it's, it's killer for that. It just feeds all of these insecurities that people have. And on top of that, we can thank Charles Schumer, one of the most senior Democrats in the Senate, for inviting Netanyahu to address a joint session of Congress, <laughs> just where he's incredible. just going to give a re-election speech for Donald Trump. Trump. Yeah. And these people will be like, thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you. We love Israel. It's not Biden's fault that he loses. Yeah, yeah. It's just, yeah. Just uh, as long as we're talking about Netanyahu, uh, I, I did enjoy this story about his uh his son. And this speaks to like, I don't know, like the, the crack up of like the basket case, like I- Israel being a basket case country is beginning to like the, there is tension that's grating internally. And that includes uh, Yair Netanyahu posted and then deleted a video <laughs> yeah. of by a Netanyahu loyalist in Gaza threatening defense minister Yoav Gallant with a military coup if he did not change tactics coup, yeah. to allow an accelerated genocide. This is Max Blumenthal reporting that. But I just I like why isn't more of a like why isn't a bigger deal made out of the fact that Yair Netanyahu is cooling his heels posting groipers in Miami right now? Like what what yeah. this, this this kid isn't pick up do a any, gun like, and get yeah, on the front is this line. Yeah, he's going to do there, any so. his, his national service or whatever. Uh yeah, that's that that would be an interesting question to ask somebody if if uh, or ask him if he was uh, available and, for questions. And you know what? Like as long as we're on the topic when it comes to the what leverage the Biden administration has, I think the son of the Israeli prime minister literally being in the inside the borders of the United States <laughs> might provide some kind of leverage, I don't know. Uh yeah, I don't know. We'd have to raid Mar-a-Lago or wherever he is to take him out or get him get him into custody. I don't know where he's uh, holed up. Navy SEALs. Where 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 are these Navy SEALs when we need them? <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, Felix, you mentioned at the beginning of the show, uh, once again, Operation Prosperity Garden, the Houthis, they, they finna fuck far fucked around and found out about the Chuck Norris's of countries. And now, now they have another capable of hitting ships in the Mediterranean. <laughs> and basically, we have already given up the ghost on this shit. Like, yeah. I mean, what a, I mean, like, just, yeah, L on top of L. I, yeah, no, I, the thing that's been amazing about this one to me is like the, exact same people who were like they're about to find out why we can't read they like uh they are doing the same thing like they just they're undeterred by it like china did a bunch of military exercises around taiwan which seems to happen like once every six months and then nothing happens but these people were like oh china china is about to fuck around and find out though there, this is the time. <laughs> yeah, one, of the, one of these yeah. days, we're going to find a country that's tiny enough and helpless enough that they will fuck around and find out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. People like it. Just like it, it, it's fascinating to me because it's like they don't. There's no like data that they can evince from this. Like the Houthis greatly expanded their strength capabilities during our time there. All we did was just like create a like uh, I guess three new uh, veteran benefits pools for the guys who fell in the water. And they're <laughs> like, this doesn't say anything about our capabilities or like, you know, how, how short-sighted or idiotic our, 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 our mission goals are, how like our pilots now, they just put markers on the sides of their planes just when they like fire a missile. Not even when they hit it. <laughs> <laughs> like the Red Baron. Yeah. Like the Red Baron. Yeah. 
I got hit my quota, boss. I, I got I fired five missiles. Like it's a, it's a it's it is like a time honored thing to like put something on the side of your plane when you shoot something down. Like if you shoot down like a helicopter, you put a helicopter on it. You you know it's uh, aces have always done that, but I've never heard of people just being like, I fired this missile today. I fired this missile. I fired this missile. Did you hit anything? Probably not. No, but I fired them. It's um, I mean, it it was shocking to me, uh, you know, to read these. Uh, there was uh, there've been pieces now about you know where we're acknowledging basically that they can uh, hit the Mediterranean. We're acknowledging that this attrition war that we've been pretending to fight for the last few months hasn't really done anything to their capabilities. But the the wildest thing is uh, apparently like the Saudi government is asking the U.S. not to use its air bases to carry out any attacks on Yemen, which is such a reversal from when they were doing the bombing and we were supporting them in every way. Uh, now they're like, yeah, we really don't want to fuck around with these guys anymore. Could you, yeah. could you not get us involved? I mean, because, yeah, like they had all the Saudis had all the help in the world. And they I mean, they really didn't shy away from committing horrific war crimes. I mean, the Saudi and UAE uh, invasion of Yemen was just like it was honestly one of the worst, uh, worst and most genocidal uses of air power that we've seen since now. Uh, And they still kind of got their shit pushed in. They don't want to do that again. No, they're, I mean, they're trying to negotiate a peace deal and and they're like, you know, you guys are really mucking this up for us, which uh, again, quite a role reversal. I want to get to the, uh, the sort of trilateral diplomacy that's currently being uh, cooked up right now, but uh, just briefly, uh, back to the pier, uh, Derek, you said, uh, you know, all, all the pieces of Lego that they used to construct it are being floated to that, the yes. one major pier, and it, it occurred to me that, like, uh, that's probably the only business that that pier has had in the last couple months because of the Houthis. <laughs> <laughs> This is like, yeah, yeah, yeah these guys just sitting on the docks. I, yeah, like nothing else you know, is coming I mean, in other than the broken shards of our giant metaphor for imperial uh, <laughs> decadence and failure. There was a, a big flower shipment that came in to Ashdod a f- several weeks ago that the U.S. was behind that was supposed to go to Gaza. Gaza. <laughs> and the Israelis were just like, no, fuck that. We're not doing it. Yeah. And again, you know, another time when when we, you know, rode Biden around like a pony. Uh, the U.S. was like, well, we really would like that aid to go in. And it said, no. Well, OK, sorry. Speaking of another thing that uh, like is just uh, regardless of your feelings on the policy, it really makes the United States look completely incompetent and feckless. Derek, what can you tell us about the Israelis killing an Egyptian soldier on the border this week? Which, by the way, has been subject to a complete news blackout. Yeah, I don't I don't know very much about this. As you say, it's there's been a, a dearth of news about it. And I'm not sure. Even the Israeli or Egyptian governments know very much. They both say they're investigating uh, what happened. This took place the same night as the uh, the tent camp airstrike. Uh, and I, I don't know if it was like some Egyptian border guard like heard about that and just, you know, reacted and, and you know, sparked a, a shootout or what. The tensions uh, between the Israelis and, and the Egyptians have been pretty high for you know a couple of weeks now over a couple of weeks you know, since the uh, israelis went into rafa they seized the rafa side of the rafa checkpoint which goes runs between egypt and gaza directly they they took over that side of the checkpoint uh and the egyptians then closed it on their side uh you know partly i think for fear that uh the israelis were suddenly were you know going to start telling Uh, displaced people to head for the checkpoint and cross into Egypt, which the Egyptian government doesn't want. Uh, So they've closed it and no aid is getting through that has been getting through that checkpoint for, for a a while now, the Egyptians only just agreed to divert uh, some of the aid that's been languishing in Sinai to into Southern Israel, to the Karim Shalom checkpoint, which also runs through Southern, through Southern Israel in this case into Gaza Um, but the tension between Egypt and Israel over this has been very high because of course the Israelis feel like, uh, you know, they're getting blamed for the humanitarian situation. And again, this is something that they've caused, but is not in any way their fault. Uh, so they're blaming Egypt for closing the checkpoint. And that's been, you know, it's led to a, a a pretty heated back and forth, not to shoot out, not to, you know, shooting until the other night, but, you know, having Egyptian border guards who I imagine don't have particularly warm feelings about. Israel right now and and Israeli forces 
so close together uh, at at that checkpoint is is a recipe for uh, stuff like this to happen. I think. Um, but moving on to the, uh, the the larger diplomatic, the grand the grand power game at play here in the Biden White House and State Department, uh, there were news reports this week of like a continued sort of overtures of like trying to have some sort of security deal with Saudi Arabia in exchange for Israel recognizing Palestine. It's like this, the, all, the, all the chess pieces on the board sort of moving in concert to get to a situation where Israel will recognize Palestine. And we'll have some sort of normalized relations with Saudi Arabia. Like, how, how's the, how does this all work, Derek? So the idea, uh, basically, this is the brainchild of and the obsession, really, for, for you know, 20 or so years of uh, a guy named Brett McGurk, who has been advising four straight U.S. presidents now on Middle East policy and doing a fantastic job, <laughs> uh, I might add. Um, yeah, why do you think they've kept him? Why do you think they've kept him on? Dude, he is he is like Robert Ory. He's been on every winning team. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's, he's at his highest level, uh, been promoted to his highest level yet. He's the Middle East coordinator for the National Security Council uh, under Biden. Um, he actually quit the Trump administration at one point when Trump uh, announced that they were pulling out of Syria. Uh, he quit in a huff, but now he's been brought back in by the Biden administration. So he's he's been obsessed with the idea of doing a, a normalization deal with the Saudis that would involve the U.S. giving them some kind of security commitment and the Saudis normalizing relations with Israel. Uh, the Biden administration, having watched uh, the Trump administration do these Abraham Accords, which were partly, I think, also uh, McGurk's doing, where they got uh, the UAE and Bahrain, Morocco, uh, all to normalize relations with Israel in exchange for uh, a various, you know, various goodies. The, the Trump administration recognized Western Sahara as Moroccan territory, for example. Having watched them do that and then lose the election, the Biden administration has decided somehow that doing a deal between the Saudis and Israelis would be good politics and would really help uh, Joe Biden's case in November. Um, They've since rolled that up into the Gaza situation, feeling like this is a way to solve all our problems, to get, you know, extricate ourselves from this this crisis in Gaza, to, to say to the Israelis, look, We'll offer the Saudis a, a security deal. Uh, they've also now offered the Saudis help with their nuclear program. What could go wrong there? Um, in return for which the Saudis and Israelis would do a normalization deal, and the Israelis uh, would end the end the fighting certainly in Gaza, and then take some what they're calling tangible step uh, toward or irreversible step, maybe the term that they're using now, uh, toward Palestinian statehood. Um, this is in effect a weakening of the Arab peace deal, which has been on the table for, for a long time, uh, that all, you know, the Arab states always said, you know, we'll recognize Israel and, and normalize relations when there is a Palestinian state. So this is a weakening of that to, you know, from Palestinian statehood to some irreversible step toward Palestinian statehood. The Israelis have refused. And certainly since October 7th, there's, you know, the, they have a- abjectly refused to consider uh, doing anything uh, in the in the way of Palestinian statehood. Prior to October seventh, there was some reporting that the deal was going to get done anyway. That they were just going to throw the Palestinians under the bus the way they did with the Abraham Accords in the first place. Um, since then, the Saudis, I think, have have kind of clenched up. They're they're not willing to to do. They they, they want to have something to point to uh, to say we we achieved this. Um, and the Israelis are refusing. But now the reporting is that the, the Biden administration's just going to go ahead with the binding security commitment and the nuclear stuff, uh, that leg of it, and, and you know, kind of hope that the Israelis will see the light and come on board with the rest of it. But basically, they're just going to give this stuff to the Saudis, uh, which is great, especially now that, you know, there's uh, all this reporting about how involved the Saudis were in 9-11. I think it's fantastic that we're uh, we're giving them a, a binding security <laughs> commitment. <laughs> you know what? If Joe Biden can bring together the two most evil countries on the planet, save for our own, I think that would be a major foreign policy, you know, accomplishment of, I mean, on par with the peer. Have, have you forgotten Absolutely, about the peer? Yeah, yeah <laughs> so we, we can, all I mean, we can bring the back peer. the axis of evil to, to you know, <laughs> yeah. this deal. Another major international story that happened over the last couple of weeks that we have not talked on 
is the death of Iran's president, Ibrahim Rassi, who was killed in a helicopter crash. He basically Kobe Bryant did it himself. And I guess my question is, Derek, like how what are the implications for Iran? Like who who is Rossi? Like, how would you describe him as a political figure within Iran? And like also, why couldn't he have just taken a car? Uh, <laughs> so I would fly in a helicopter through that. I, I I mean, when this happened, I was like, uh, oh well, you know, I mean, uh, Iranian aircraft are old. They're they're often out of uh they're not in perfect condition because of sanctions that the US has had in place since the Iranian revolution, really, they, they can't buy new helicopters. They can't buy new uh, airplanes. So maybe there was just a, a mechanical thing that went, that happened. And then they showed pictures of the rescue operation that was in this like pea soup fog. And it's like, why, why the fuck would you fly any helicopter in conditions like that? I guess they just smacked into a mountain because you couldn't see where they were gone. Um, so yeah, it's, it's um, Raisi. I would, I would describe he, he was, uh, committed, very hardline conservative, uh, more or less an appendage uh, in some ways of the Supreme Leader of Iran, Ali Khamenei. Um, his legacy is is going to be very mixed. I think you know I, there was there were these uh, funeral services that took place uh, last week. They they kind of you know moved his uh, procession. It was it was not just him. It was the Foreign Minister Hossein Amir Abdullahian was on the helicopter along with a number of other officials, but they kind of took their bodies in a procession through uh, Tabriz and then Qom to Tehran and then uh, took Raisi to Mashhad, which was his hometown for, to, and laid him to rest. And every stop there were these, um, you know, big outpourings, processions, thousands of people in the streets kind of uh, mourning his passing. I think for, for uh, if you talk to Iranians in general, his legacy would be far more mixed than those uh, images might have conveyed. He was, First of all, long before he was president in the 1980s, he was implicated heavily in uh, the mass execution of a, a number of political prisoners in 1988. That is uh, one of the black, real black marks against uh, the Islamic Republic. Uh, so he had that on his record. And then as president, he's overseen a pretty dismal uh, economy. I mean, even as sanctions, you know, the Iranians have found more ways to get around U.S. sanctions. Um, that the, the economy still remains pretty, pretty dismal, which is, you know, it's a big thing for any president. And he has, uh, he oversaw, uh, the violent crackdown against, uh, the Masamini protests, uh, in which, you know, a few hundred people were killed. Um, you know, that, that I think is another you know, tick on his record as far as uh, a lot of Iranians are concerned. So I, I think, you know, in terms of a legacy, that's, that's probably what what people would uh, would talk about and what does i mean like does this have any broader implications for iran and like or iran as you know possibly the only credible deterrence against the nuclear armed rogue state that is our wonderful ally israel <laughs> uh, it does i mean they have to have a presidential election now and it's very unclear uh, to me uh who's even going to run in this election let alone who's going to be favored to win the election is supposed to take place on uh, June 28th. Um, there's been, there's been speculation about a lot of people. Some, some of them, uh, have, who have run for president in the past, like, uh, the speaker of the Iranian parliament, Mohammed, uh, Kalibov, he was just reelected speaker. So I'm not sure, uh, he's going to run for president now that he's secured that. Um, there are some other sort of interesting names that have been bandied about, but that'll, I mean, that's, uh, the most immediate concern is that uh, is who replaces uh, Raisi. If it's another kind of strict kind of principalist uh, conservative, then you probably won't see uh, much change in Iranian foreign policy. And, you know, a lot of that's dictated by the Supreme Leader anyway, um, and the, the people around him. But if if they allow a more moderate figure to run and there have been a couple of names thrown around that are interesting uh like Ali Larajani who's a former parliament speaker and not really a moderate but sort of a moderate conservative kind of the Mitt Romney lane in Centrist. Iranian politics um and, and so if if he's allowed to run and he was uh screened out he was he was denied uh, the right to be on the ballot in 2021 but if they let him run this time uh you know in terms of name recognition he would certainly be at the top of the list of 
candidates, I think. And that could augur some kind of a change in terms of uh, Iran's diplomacy. It, Raisi focused a lot and uh, Amir Abdullahi on focused a lot on diplomacy with the Gulf states. And they were quite successful at that. They had, you know, there was the Chinese brokered uh, deal with the Saudis to reopen embassies and send ambassadors. They've, they've improved relations with the UAE. Uh, so that's been the focus. If, if somebody like Lara Johnny were elected, that might indicate that they, there's going to be a, a, an effort to make more of an outreach toward uh, the West uh, possibly, because that, that would be the, the lane that he's occupied. Um, the bigger the bigger issue and the thing that looms behind all of this is that Khamenei is 85. He's had cancer in the past. Uh, you know, there's going to be a transition at supreme at the position of supreme leader, probably in the the relatively near future. Uh, Iran's only gone through that once since the revolution, so there's not a great precedent for how it will go. Um, the there was some speculation. There's been speculation that Raisi was being groomed. Uh, as Khamenei's successor, I think that is probably overblown. Uh, I, I think he was on a list at one point, but his time uh, as a politician, kind of, you know, the run he ran in 2017 and lost, he ran in 2021 and won, uh, has revealed a couple of things about him or revealed a couple of things. One is that he had the charisma of like sawdust. Uh, and two uh, is that he just wasn't i mean partly for that reason but partly for you know his performance as president just wasn't all that popular i mean he kind of discredited himself in a sense uh so i don't know that he was you know on the short list anymore or a favorite to succeed uh how many e but i think having him as a loyal kind of acolyte of how many e as president if there had been a transition in the next you know, five years or, you know, I'd assume he would have won re-election. So if there had been that transition to have Khamenei in that, in the position of president to kind of shepherd things through would have been, I think, important for, for Khamenei to ensure that his successor, you know, his succession played out the way that he would like. Well, uh, I mean, there's one figure that's been speculated who, who, you know, we know has the riz to do it, but Derek, why are people uh, mistaken to believe that Mahmoud Ahmadinejad could make another go of it this time around? Because I mean, we, we know he can get elected. I mean, despite yeah. being a short man, he's got he's got big big dick energy. He's, he's got riz. He's got riz for sure. Um, the Ahmadinejad's problem is that he ended his uh, presidency on really bad terms with Khamenei. There were reports that they clashed over appointments. Uh, that Ahmadinejad was trying to effectively. Um, usurp some of the Supreme Leader's prerogatives to appoint people in security positions. Uh, and they just really ended on, on bad notes. Now, how many has ended pretty much every presidential term with every, every uh, person who has served as president before Raisi, obviously. But, uh, you know, there was Hashemi Rafsanjani, there was Mohammed Khatami, there was Ahmadinejad, there was Hassan Rouhani. Every one of them has ended their presidency on worse terms with how many than they were, they had going in but Ahmadinejad seemed to be like really almost personal in a sense like just they, they couldn't get along with each other uh at, at that point and so Ahmadinejad has registered because Iranian presidents you can serve two consecutive terms you have to then you know go away for a term but you can come back and run again and Ahmadinejad has has registered to run a file to run in every presidential election since uh you know since he's been eligible again and he's been screened out by the Guardian Council uh, every time, probably because of you know this this bad relationship with Khamenei. So I think there's two things that he would that would block him. One is just the relationship is is not good, and two is at this point they've they've blocked him so many times for supposed uh, you know inadequacy, disability, you know uh, corruption. I think is the the claim that it would be really weird for them to let him run this time. Like it would be it would be too difficult to try and explain that. Uh, to the public. Every time he applies, the Guardian Council sends him back a secret forbidden recording of Randy Newman. Short people got no reason to live. <laughs> he's like, he's like, it's so weird because it's like he was president, but now he's like vermin supreme. Like everyone is like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, every, yeah. Every, he was literally the president, but now for the past like 10 years, everyone's been like, can you fuck off? Like, we get it. Like, go away. <laughs> <laughs> he's i mean he's not as he doesn't have it quite as bad as hatami who can't even get like on tv anymore like he was ex-president and he's 
basically a non-person in Iran now. Like you're not allowed to cover him. You're not allowed to talk to him, whatever. Uh, that's more political though. I mean, he really yeah. drifted into the reformist camp. And I think, you know, just for political reasons, it's no longer, uh, you know, allowable to, uh, to kind of acknowledge his existence. Ahmadinejad, like I said, there's this like, real nastiness it seems like uh, and you know i'm obviously an outside observer but that's just the way it strikes me is, is being this real kind of personal uh, grievance i actually i i have a question about um iran russia stuff that i was uh wondering if you had any insights on uh you touched on briefly how um you know the iranian fleet of aircrafts are famously you know in ill repair due to sanctions and uh, right. other things like they, one of the funniest things they've done is like, and they don't really have a choice, right? Because it's like, where are they going to buy it? But they, right. they have F fives that were made in like the the sixties and they, they uh, just tilted the rear stabilizer, like the horizontal stabilizers, 45 degrees to make them look like American F 18 Hornets. <laughs> And we're like, look, we made our own plane. There you go. And it's just like an F5 with like a fucked up stabilizer. <laughs> but um, they like since about 2008, they've been saying that they they ordered a bunch of like, you know, fourth generation Russian fighter jets, uh, right. Sukhoi 35s, and that Russia was set to deliver them. But either one of two things happened that. Israel cock blocked them, which is like incredibly likely, or that Iran just like did not have the money in the account, which I guess could be possible, but I just don't see them like making the order and then being like, whoops, we don't have any money. Yeah, you never know. I mean, you know, the Iranian government is not known for its uh, uh, bureaucratic sophistication. Yeah, so true. I mean, you never know. Yeah. But like, you know, given that it, probably like they they do they clearly have money to like pay for other things they have like modernized a lot of their other weapon systems do you think do you think there's any possibility of russia sort of like just telling israel to go screw and like finally giving them some modern like uh some modern fighter jets i it's possible i i mean i think it would uh you know part of the russian consideration is that they don't want israel escalating in syria they i mean they're they're okay with the like airstrikes that hit hezbollah or uh you know these other militia sites but they they don't want the israelis to go uh any further than that and so they have this sort of concordance uh, effectively in syria where they're like we're we're on opposite sides but we're not gonna you know we're not gonna hit any facilities where there might be russian soldiers or we're not gonna hit we're not gonna try to take out bashar al-assad or anything like that um, so I don't know. I mean, the Russians have a, a pretty vested interest in in keeping that going. I, it would take something, you know, where they didn't care about that anymore. I think for them to just tell the Israelis to to piss off. Um, I mean, any, you know, it's possible if the Israelis um, and this is I mean, this is also what keeps Israel from from or has kept Israel in part from from getting more involved in Ukraine. I mean, the Ukrainians have complained uh, or or were at least complaining, you know, uh, for a while there about the Israelis not providing them with uh, weapons, with air defenses, with any, you know, that sort of thing. And, and, and just kind of providing them with materiel rather than, than arms. Uh, and it's part, that's partly why. So I think it goes both ways. You know, I, I, I don't know, except, you know, if to say, uh, because they don't make it a priority, I don't know why the Iranians don't go to the Russians and say, Hey, could you like fit our, president out with a helicopter that isn't 50 years old yeah um, yeah that that to me is is uh you know a question that i i, I can't really answer other than again they, they just don't care as much about that as they do about the the military side yeah i mean it is puzzling the helicopter thing i mean you can get you could get a like not shitty helicopter for not that much um yeah or even i mean if you if it was for the president, I mean, that's that's the kind of thing that you do as a gift almost. I mean, or, uh, yeah, you know, if you want to want to just, uh, you know, tighten the relationship. Uh, but, you know, it's not to be, I guess. Not should be helicopters soon to be available at chapotraphouse.com slash merch <laughs> slash helicopters. I, guys, you know it. I know it. I've been playing DCS and I finally made my own helicopter. <laughs> if you're the Iranian government, <laughs> I have one just for you. Enter code CHAPO to get 20% off. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, well, uh, we bring up Russia. So uh, let's, let's take let's take a pause to consider the the ongoing conflict, uh, the invasion of Ukraine, like that whole theater of war. And uh, Reuters, there was a Reuters report that cited four Russian sources that reported on Friday that. Russian President Vladimir Putin is ready to halt the war in Ukraine with a negotiated ceasefire that recognizes the current battlefield lines. Uh, Derek, like, what, what are the pro- like, uh, what are the prospects of like any kind of negotiated settlement or end to this war that recognizes the current battle lines? And if not, what like what what is the future of this conflict? Is it ever going to fucking end? So, I mean, there's a there's a few things that uh, go at cross purposes here, and I think we've we've talked about this uh, probably you know when I've been on here in the past. The the one that comes to came to mind immediately when I saw that story is that if Zelensky were to cut a deal with Russia on current lines, the current the current battle lines, and and we would recognize Russia's control over the territory that it and it wouldn't have to be formal recognition, right? It could just be like we're going to do a ceasefire uh, on these lines, and we're still going to claim that these parts of the country are are uh, part of Ukraine, but you know we'll uh, we'll stand down. He's he's going to get killed. I mean, he's going to be killed. Uh, he will be assassinated. I, I think that's almost a you know certainty. Um, so he doesn't have a, a good, a strong incentive uh, right now to make a deal like that. Um, I think that the appetite for the war is waning somewhat uh, in the West, and you can see that in the politics about, of it. Um, th- they're trying to reinvigorate things by getting into the issue of you know can, how how far can we go with stealing russian state assets basically and and, uh, giving them to the ukrainians and that's been the the discussion that's gone on the g7 in the eu there there's a lot of you know can we set this up as a a a funding stream for the ukrainians that doesn't require us to take any increasingly unpopular votes or do anything that would you know cost us politically um so there's that uh piece of it and if they they can do that then then there's less incentive for the the western backers to say uh you know maybe it would be a good idea to talk um, I, I don't think, you know, e- e- even taking everything in good faith, like, like nobody's gonna agree, uh, to do anything drastic on the basis of an anonymously sourced report about something that Vladimir Putin might've said to somebody because he has no credibility in the West. And, and, you know, that's, that's understandable, I think at this point, to some degree, uh, that said, I mean, I've, I've maintained this whole time. There should be negotiations happening at some level, even if it's just like, two guys on a phone that are like, you know, deputy, 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 foreign ministry people, there should still be some communication that's happening. There's, there's always this perception in the West that like, if you talk to somebody, you've like given them some big win and and they don't want to negotiate with Putin because, uh, you know, it'd be seen as legitimizing him or something. And I, I, it it always strikes me as just, and let's not forget legitimize. I, they, that reminds oh, it, it reminds me of when people are like, "Why would you platform Trump?" Like when he was the president. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's the fucking president. <laughs> um, yeah, it's 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 absurd. I mean, it's like like talking to Anthony Blinken is is some great prize that the you know the Russians are dying <laughs> to to get, and and we can't give it to them because you know it would be. Uh, would be rewarding them somehow. It just doesn't make any sense. Well, you, you say that, but could the Russians resist? Unless he was going to bring his guitar. If yes, he was going to bring his guitar and play some the old licks, axe. Then, so then little, you know, I could see. BB King. <laughs> you don't get to hear the tunes unless you unless you surrender. You know, it's funny. Uh, 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 the, Anthony Blinken did meet the devil at the crossroads to sell his soul, but unfortunately he still sucks shit at playing guitar. But, however, <laughs> he is very good at uh, doing a Holocaust. What if like Anthony Blinken got up there, uh, you know, singing like Steve Martin and the jerk, uh, <laughs> he did like doing his regular thing and Putin just like he burst into tears. Like he can't, it's his favorite thing he's ever heard. <laughs> he loves it. It changes everything. Like Russia joins NATO. <laughs> he, he loves it so much. It's so good. Somebody gets a look in Putin's private office. He's got like big posters of Anthony Blinken with his guitar <laughs> on the wall. <laughs> Vladimir, why are the lips on your Anthony Blinken poster worn out? <laughs> you know, uh, I feel like like we we've talked before on this show 
about how dramatically worse everything has gotten in the world ever since Anthony Blinken did his cover of uh, what, fuck, what song was it? Hoochie Coochie Man. Knows who I am? <laughs> <laughs> it but, really, but then, everything has collapsed since then. <laughs> I'm a hoochie coochie man. The world will know who I am. And okay, like you think you think they would have gotten the point after that, but then like what like two weeks ago I heard he was in fucking Ukraine doing a cover of Keep on Rocking in the Keep Free World. So that does not augur well for Ukraine at all. They're gonna be yeah. a fucking they're gonna be a Russian gat like fucking supermarket by the end of the fucking month. I I never want to hear like any democrat ever again make fun of like trump or somebody for playing born in the usa at a campaign i know rally it's like after doing- listen to a fucking lyric politicians listen to the lyrics of the songs that you pick challenge yeah rocking is a amazing. free world it's not even like born in the born in the usa if you like pa- sort of passively listen to it like i could see how someone could just think it's like a patriotic song even though that's also stupid just you know musically but like rocket in the free world isn't like an upbeat song in any way <laughs> like no. it, it just there's no part of it that could confuse you but we're rocking in the free world so you know. uh no a- anthony anthony blinken heard the verse about a woman putting her baby in a garbage dumpster and thought mm, oh, good foreign, that's ex- that's actually acceptable foreign policy to me <laughs> in fact that does not cross my red line young man <laughs> Uh, before we get you out of here, Derek, uh, a few other uh, global hotspots to touch on. So sure. I'm going to ask a very ignorant question. Number one, what is going on in French New Caledonia? And two, what the fuck is French New Caledonia? <laughs> <laughs> so New Caledonia is a territory, euphemistically put. It's a colony. It's a French colony uh, in uh, in Oceania and the kind of you know South Pacific. Uh, region it is one of the reason why part part of the reason why the french don't just decolonize this place and get out uh, is because it's one of the world's largest sources of nickel which happens to be an important metal for the uh, green energy transition and so you know france the french government would like to hold on to this this place uh, at all costs uh, you know to compete with china i guess if nothing else new caledonia the indigenous population the kanak population uh, of new caledonia there is a strong independence movement and has been uh for uh quite some time uh the french government back uh i'm gonna actually look this up so i'm i'm sure i get it right uh there was an agreement that the french government made in the late 90s called the numea accord after the capital of new caledonia numea in which uh france agreed to allow uh, over the, the next 20 years to allow New Caledonia to hold three independence referendums. And if any one of them had gone uh, you know, for independence, then New Caledonia would have been allowed to, to leave. So the third and final of those referendums was held in 2021, and all three of them you know, voted to stay uh, part of France. The Kanak uh, separatist movement argues that the 2021 referendum uh, was rigged basically and not not in the counting like not in the 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 mechanical aspects of it but that the french government deliberately kind of sprung this referendum on everybody right after covid was you know sort of right as covid was starting to die down because they wanted basically to suppress turnout and engineer the engineer an outcome so they want to do over i mean they 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 reject that referendum as illegitimate and they want to do over so that's underpinning a lot of this along with all the sort of things that go along with being a colony, the inequality, the, the economic struggles, the, um, you know, uh, all the, the, the various grievances that one would have as a, a colonial situation. Um, what's happened recently is the French government has been talking about amending the constitution to uh, reduce the residency requirements for people to vote in local elections in New Caledonia. For example, if there were another independence referendum, uh, that you would have a uh, more uh, short timer French nationals uh, who would be eligible to vote in a contest like that in the future. And again, this is viewed uh, by the Kanak uh, leaders as as a 
an attempt to circumvent the independence movement or undermine it by allowing these, you know, interlopers uh, to vote in local elections. Uh, so that sparked uh, protests. Those protests became violent. I think at this point, seven people have been killed in various scenarios uh, during the protests. Uh, the French government imposed a state of emergency. They've now lifted that ostensibly to allow uh, you know, civil society to get in there and, and for negotiations to take place. Um, the the constitutional amendment, that process has been also suspended uh, to allow time for things to calm down. But but things are still tense. They're, the protesters have been erecting roadblocks. Uh, they in particular have targeted the main highway from uh, the capital to the, the territory's main international airport, um, that, which is shut down and is going to be shut down, I think, for a, at least a few more days. Um, so the, the, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, that's, those are the basics. It's, it's still pretty tense, uh, situation. Macron was just there, I think last week, uh, to try and calm things down. And, you know, of course, uh, didn't calm them down because they need a Jupiterian presence in New Caledonia. Like why would, why would seeing Emmanuel Macron in person make you less angry? I don't understand that. Uh, that would seem like it would just enrage people further. Um, so, so that didn't work. Um, but yeah. they're, they've sort of, as I said, they've sort of put all the really, you know, egregious stuff that, that on hold, uh, like the state of emergency, like the constitutional amendment, uh, in hopes that, that, you know, things will calm down a bit. It's good to know that France is in the 21st century, like, Still in some small corner of the world, like working on one of those censored Tintin books. They're still up there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're they're sort of the most like groped up country. Gerard yeah. Depardieu kind of looks like Groper. <laughs> he does. He fucking does. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Lastly, um, since the last time we talked to you, um, there, there's still, you know, an ongoing, a horrific and ongoing civil war in Sudan right now. Uh, since the last time we spoke to you about that, uh, have there been any major shifts in uh, that conflict since you last updated us on that? Um, yes. I mean, the major uh, focus at this point has been the city of El Fasher. Uh, the major focus for, for several weeks now has been the city of El Fasher, which is located in North Darfur State. Uh, it's the one big city, big-ish city in Darfur that is still at least nominally in government control Um uh, the or military control, I guess, if you the Sudanese military equate that as the legitimate, uh, so to speak, government of Sudan, uh, the rapid support forces who are you know, who's been who've been battling the military for uh, you know over a year now uh, have surrounded Al Fasher. Uh, they haven't attacked it yet in earnest. There's been fighting on the outskirts for for as I say a couple of weeks now. Um, they are recalling. Uh, tribal fighters, essentially, the rapid support forces movement or a uh, uh, unit grew out of the the Janjaweed movement, which was a, a, the Arab tribes in Darfur who were primarily uh, directly responsible for the genocide in Darfur uh, of non-Arab people. So uh, they still have that network in place, and they've been recalling these militia fighters from other parts of Sudan, from uh, other parts of the region where they've, you know, some of them have drifted off to go work as mercenaries, for example, in Libya and other places. Uh, so they've been recalling them uh, back. And I think the, the, the aim is to sort of assemble as many fighters as they can before they uh, attack the city. El Fasher, because it is the last city in Darfur that, that's been out, remained out of RSF control, has become a humanitarian hub. It's become a haven for people displaced. Uh, from other parts of the region by by RSF attacks that have involved in many cases very gruesome, very violent attacks on non-Arab communities. Uh, you know that that people have compared to uh, the worst uh, days of the Darfur genocide. So there's hundreds of thousands of people. I saw one estimate that was put it at like 2.5 million. I'm not sure it's it's that high, but hundreds of thousands of people certainly trapped now and en en encircled in this city. Um, and, you know, just waiting for the hammer to come down. The Sudanese military seems powerless to do anything about this. Um, hospitals, there's only one functioning hospital left in the city and it's overwhelmed and running out of supplies. Uh, they're running out of food. They're running out of water. Uh, you know, there's been calls for the RSF to open up humanitarian corridors. And I think at one point they suggested they would be willing to open up evacuation corridors to allow people to leave. I, I don't know why anybody in this situation would would believe that their track record of, of just massacring 
civilians, frankly, at this point is, is well established. And I think anybody who, any groups of, of people who were in the, you know, again, kind of the non Arab Darfurian uh, communities, the, the Masalit uh, is the biggest, or there's some others, but any of those people who, who left Al Fasher at this point, uh, you know, under quote unquote RSF protection would be opening themselves up to just being slaughtered. So I don't, I don't know if anybody's going to trust them uh, when they say that they'll allow evacuations. Um, and that's, that's where things stand. It's really horrifying. I mean, it's really uh, just an impending uh, nightmare that's, that, you know, has been slowly unfolding and people are just waiting for the, uh, as I said, for the, the hammer to drop. And like, where does um, like U.S. state policy, uh, like, where, where do we like? Are we doing anything about this? What about other African states or like uh, Gulf <laughs> nations? Like, I mean, like, who, like, uh, is any effort being made uh, uh, with regards to this conflict? Uh, um, Gulf nations, yes. I mean, the UAE has been arming the RSF, so they've oh, okay, been supporting good. the RSF uh, with drones and and other things. So, so they're definitely involved. Um, Iran has gotten involved in this. The, the, mili- the Sudanese military has uh, reportedly purchased drones from Iran that they've used to some success in other parts of the country. But as I say, they don't they don't seem able to even get to to El Fasher, let alone to do anything to kind of lift the siege. They seem pretty uh, pretty much checked out in this situation. Um, and and that may be. I mean, that may not be a matter of capability they may not just not give a shit frankly uh, what happens here the so i mean there has been involvement from those directions saudi arabia has been uh, along with the us they have tried uh, you know peace talks and jed or ceasefire talks at least between the two sides that have gone nowhere there've been initiatives from uh kind of supranational blocks the the uh, intergovernmental authority on development which is the horn of africa uh, block uh, South Sudan and, and other countries uh, have tried to organize their own peace process that that hasn't gone anywhere. Um, yeah, so so really, I mean, it's been it's been ineffectual to the extent that there's outside involvement. It's been arming uh, the parties and, and kind of intensifying and uh, it, m- you know pushing pushing things uh, to to more. Kind of intense violence and and extending the conflict, I think, beyond where either of these sides could have managed to to achieve uh, on their own. <sighs> well, uh, that's a way to put a button on another wonderful trip around the world of foreign yeah, policy good, and conflict. Good ending. Yeah, um, just uh, Anthony Blinken, keep strumming away. The world needs your songs. Blessed are the music makers. Heal. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> We can heal through the power of music, Anthony, if you just keep practicing. Um, we'll leave it there for today. I want to thank Derek Davison of Foreign Exchanges and American Prestige. Derek, uh, if you have anything to plug at the end of the show? I, I not, not anything pe- pending, but we, I did just publish uh, a piece at Foreign Exchanges uh, about from, from Sam Hunicke, who's a, a great historian of Germany, post-war Germany, uh, about why uh, the German government is so fucked up about Israel. Uh, and continues to just not be normal uh, about this and has been, you know, shutting down protests and shutting down pro-Palestine events. Uh, it's really good. It gets into, you know, sort of deep into the, the history of post-war Germany. Uh, so uh, that was just up today. If people want to check that out, I, I, I would uh, I would be grateful for that.